just went over imports and exports in excruciating detail. So there's one more thing we want to talk about with respect to exports before we uh, continue on to a bunch of miscellaneous little stuff. All right, forwarded exports. So what we had just seen was the case where the normal case for exports, we've got these you know, three tables. Oh, sorry, actually, I missed one thing. So all right, let's start here, right? This is our normal case for exports. We've got these three tables hanging off of the image export directory structure. There's only one of those image export directory structures. We've got a table which has RVAs for the actual starts of the functions. And a table which has RVAs for the strings that have the names of the functions. And we've got this table which maps from this table. You take the index in this one, use it as an index in that, and that tells you the index in that one. So this is the mapping table between these two. All right, so that's the normal case of exports. And then just as a miscellaneous thing, there's the question, if you're writing like a DLL, how do you actually specify that I want to export this function? How does it show up in that table? Because nothing's going to show up in that table unless you ask for it to show up in the table. So one, you can go see this uh, link later, but the, the core three ways to do exports is from within your actual code, you can use this, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, keyword, there's a more correct term, I think macro, but I'm not sure if it is macro. So anyways, you use this keyword, uh, declospec DLL export. You just tack that in front of the function which you want to export. So if you have, you know, my function one, you just put declospec DLL export immediately in front of it. And then the linker knows to do the right thing. It says, ah, I see that you want to export function, you know, my function one. So that would be a compiler directive? It's sort of like, um, no, it's, it's really more like a linker directive actually because yeah, it, it's basically a linker directive because these two other things are actually also sort of linker options. So one, so the other one, this last one, is you can use slash export on the link. Uh, you can use it as a link command line thing or just within your Visual Studio thing. Uh, let's see if I can find it quick. <coughs> well, that's not the best one. This one's a DLL at least. I don't know where it is. Yeah, I'm not even sure if it has like a GUI version. I think if you're going to use it from here, you just uh, put right here like slash export, you know, and something like that basically. So I think you have to manually specify it. I'm not 100% sure on that. I always use Declospec DLL export. <coughs> um, and then there actually, this, this is sort of a more relevant one, this middle one. You have an, there's the possibility to have an export statement in a deal in a dot def file. Actually, I'm going to go here because I, I feel like, I feel like I'm trying to tell myself to go there since I didn't write enough information. All right. So there is the ability to create something called a dot def file. And this is an example of a .def file thing, uh, something you can have in a .def file. You would put something that says, you know, I want these exports, and then you would list which things you want to export. And so, for instance, if I just if I just have this one right here, this is a normal export by name. So there's nothing special about it. You're just saying export DLL unregistered server by name. For these ones that have the little at sign in front of them, that's saying I want to export DLL can unload now by ordinal, and the ordinal number is 1. So I don't think I ever showed you how to import by ordinal, but I, I probably should fix that, actually. Right, so you can say in your DLL, I want to export this function by ordinal. And then there's other things you can do, like say, you know, this is a private symbol or this is a public symbol. And that just has to do with, like, whether your debug symbols get put into your uh, debug information file or not. But we haven't talked about debug symbols yet. So this is just the basics, this, this uh, export thing. Uh, there is the ability to export and actually, like, change the name that you exported as. So you can say, I want function 1 to actually be exported as the name function 2. So yeah, the 
internal name goes on this side, and the actual exported name goes on that side. And so that's, for instance, if you know you want to have I don't know for whatever. If you want to have a profane internal name and then you want to export by name, that's not going to show up. Free the freaking. All right. So the exports file becomes relevant when we talk about these uh, forwarded exports as well next. But I don't think this one actually shows forwarded exports. So, all right. So those are the different ways you can say, I want to. Oh, there we go. Ha. Right there. Oh, no, that's not it. Yeah, so this is at least where if you made an exports file like that and you just had, you know, a text file that says here's exports, here's the things I want to export, this is where you would actually say, you know, here's my .def file. And then it would use, the linker would use that .def file in order to export stuff. All right. So for forwarded exports, you have the option of instead of saying, like, I export this function and here's the RVA, you can instead say, I want to like act like I export this function. I want to export a name and say like, you know, here's the name of the thing I'm exporting. But you maybe want the implementation to be handled by some other module rather than internal to your own module. So rather than giving an RVA which points into your own module, you'll give an RVA which points at a string and that string is going to say, sorry, that's actually in some other DLL. So yeah. Specifically, you're changing the RVA in this address of functions, which I had said was this first uh, export address table thing, right? So address of functions is this table right there. So if this RVA right here points into the area of memory, which happens to be specified by uh, wait, can I have it? There it is. All right. So we said that all the export information is back here. You know, you've got your data directory, right? This says a virtual, si virtual address and a size. Now, normally, this virtual address and size is just going to point at that image export directory, that you know, big square that we say there's only one of. Right. So normally, it's going to point at the start of this, and the size is only going to be the total size of this. But if you expand the size down, then what we would say is, you know, this plus whatever extra size is there, we're going to call that all the exports area. And if an RVA in this, um, which one is which? This right here. So of those, you know, when I drew it, I drew it like three arrays at the bottom. And this was the top array. Uh, this was the middle array. And this was the bottom array. And we said that top array, those all point at actual RVAs into real functions. If one of those points somewhere in this exports area where the exports area is like bigger than just that uh, data structure, if it points into the exports area, then it's, it's uh, defined to be pointing at a string. And that string will tell you where you can go actually find the module implementation. So what that would look like is the following. Um, Kernel32.dll, which is, it's, again, it's user space DLL. It's not the actual kernel. It exports a bunch of stuff, which, you know, it's showing it all sorted by, sorted by um, alphabetically. So all of these are normal RVAs. This is the uh, import address table, I believe. Yeah, or sorry, export address table. We've got the export address table, and all of these are the normal RVAs which point somewhere within my own module, and they point at the actual implementation of the function. But we can see that these are all fairly high addresses, and there's this one little low address here. It turns out this low address actually points within that exports area that I said. I said if the size of that export thing in the data directory is bigger than that structure, then that entire region is called the exports area. I guess that's what I'm going to call it. And so this one, that RVA, points into that exports area. And specifically, it points at a string that looks like ntdll dot, and then the name of the actual function that implements this. So basically, Kernel 32 is pretending that it implements a function called add vectored exception handler. But in reality, it doesn't implement it. It just forwards that on to NTDLL. And so the OS loader actually needs to know about this sort of thing so that when it goes, say, you know, say notepad imports add vectored exception handler, 
the OS can't, you know, just come here and treat that as an RVA and, you know, add the base to that RVA and stick it into the import table of Notepad. The OS needs to say, okay, you're pointing into the imports or the exports section of this module. So I need to treat that like a string and I need to go import NTDLL and then I need to go find that function within NTDLL. So this just adds a little bit of extra complexity on top of what the OS loader actually has to do when it's trying to find the real address of who's implementing this function. If it finds that it's pointing somewhere within that exports area, you know, conditional check if within the range of, you know, starting at RVA of address size, starting at this virtual address plus size, if it's within that region, then treat it like a string, break it up, you know, tokenize it based on a dot. So if there's a single period, tokenize it. The first part is going to be a DLL name. The second part is going to be the actual function name. And so we actually see this. The second thing is basically me just trying to say like, uh, down within the region which is covered, it said, you know, 9011. So this is 9008. And if I go in here, this would be 9011 because this is the NTDLL dot, where it is it, dot RTL add vector exception hammer. I mean, we all read hex, right? So you don't have to look on that side. You just like, oh yeah, I mean, there's the period. So that's like NTDLL. So, all right. So all I'm trying to, to give you a sense of right now is uh, that there is the ability to, within your module, to say, like, look, I don't actually implement this function. I mean, I really want people to call me when they want this function, but it's actually implemented somewhere else. So uh, first of all, how do we actually specify this? If I want to try to do this, how would I do this? Now we would go back to that .def file. Uh, and actually, there's a variety of doing it. So we can go with like a linker comment directly in our source code. We can say, okay, I want to export function alias to some other DLL. Or I can just on the command line pass to my linker export, you know, add vector exception handler equals ntdll.rtl add vector exception handler. Or within my exports file in my F export section of my .def file, I can say, add vectored exception handler equals NTDLL. So three different ways you can specify it, all of which are just different ways to tell the linker, go ahead and put something in that acts like I export this, you know, named thing, the function alias. But in reality, put in a string that says I actually forward this on to some other module. All right, so this has relevance to Stuxnet because this, um, so, I mean, what you can see here is that it is, kind of getting back to that notion of like man in the middling, the uh, man in the middling of function call, right? So if kernel 32 says, hey, if you want to call, you know, if you normally would have called RTL add vectored exception handler, you'll really love add vectored exception handler by kernel 32. So go ahead and import that and you'll call to my module and I'll do some stuff, right? Well, actually, sorry, that's, I just said it backwards. Yeah. Sorry. Ignore what I just said about that, and then I'll say it the right way next. It's more like for everything you don't want a man in the middle, you forward it, and for everything you do want a man in the middle, you don't forward it. All right, so this is how this happened. Um, with Stuxnet, this is from, you know, the semantic paper. There was this step seven in uh, development environment, and this was just sort of a development environment to, you know, we've got this uh, programmable logic controller sort of hardware over here, and it does whatever it does. The step seven environment was basically think like your Visual Studio for your PLC. You type up whatever logic you want this thing to implement and you say, you know, compile, send, write it to the hardware and let it do whatever it's going to do. But so the actual implementation, you know, this may be my Visual Studio, but uh, the actual library which knows how to talk to hardware, all that was implemented in this DLL, this S7 OTBX DX. DLL. So this is the DLL which actually knows how to talk to hardware. So what the attackers had done is they had, you know, functionally reverse engineered uh, this DLL to a degree that they knew, okay, well, this function, S7BLK underscore read, that's the real function which actually reads a chunk of this PLC, right? And so they knew there are certain functions in here that I care about and there's certain, the rest of the functions I don't care about. So for 93 of the 109 exports out of this thing, so this thing exported 109 functions. 
And so 93 of them, Stuxnet said, I don't care about. But the other 13, it said, I do care about, and I want to man in the middle of those. So what they did was, they took the original DLL, they renamed it, and they put it off to the side. So they said, okay, well, this thing was dx.dll. I'm going to copy it, put it off to the side. I'm now going to put my Trojan version of the DLL in there, and I'm going to name it the exact same thing. Because, right, we said before, the OS loader, when it's looking for modules to load, it just goes and searches some search path, and the first, ver the first DLL that it finds that has the name that you asked for in your imports, right, this has its import section. This thing's import section said, I want that DLL. OS loader went and checked the file system, and the very first one it found was this Trojan one, because it turns out that in terms of the um, search path that the OS loader uses, it checks the local directory first. So it's like if, you know, if this DLL is in the exact same directory as this executable, the OS loader, when it starts the executable, will say, okay, check the exact same path and see if that DLL is there. If not, you know, maybe check system 32. If not, check somewhere else, et cetera. So it's got its set of paths that it's going to check, but the key point is the local path, the, you know, dot path is the first one. So anyways, the Trojan one is sitting here in the same, uh, it's sitting here knowing that it's going to be imported by the OS loader. And so for those 13 functions that it cares about, it re-implements them. And I think in some cases it may have redirected them to this. And then eventually, yeah, so actually in reality, see this picture I don't think is really accurate because I don't think they re-implemented everything, right? So they don't want to like have to really know how this thing talks to hardware. They just want to filter the results, right? They want to filter stuff coming back and they want to filter stuff going too. So they just have a stub function here that like either filters the input or filters the output, and then they leave the hard work to the original. So it just redirects and calls the original. The original does its thing, reads or writes to the PLC, gets back the results, returns back to the Trojan version, and that'll filter something out. So the point is they modified stuff, you know. The attacker said, okay, if you're writing to this thing, I want to like write my Trojan version of stuff onto the PLC. But if you're trying to like read it back and you want to see if your PLC is modified or not, I'm going to intercept your reads. I'm going to let this do the hard work. It's going to read. It's going to bring back this blob of data. And then I'm going to check the blob of data and say, does that blob of data contain the stuff that I modified? If so, clean it up, return it back to that. It looks unmodified. So this export forwarding is basically how it implemented um, the Trojan DLL in that the Trojan DLL did the minimum amount of work. And so for things it cared about, it implemented stub function and then it redirected to the original. For things it didn't care about, it just bulk redirected them to the original. So that was those 93 things it doesn't care about. It just, in its actual exports table of this thing, it says, you know, oh, sorry, you don't want my, you know, whatever function. You want S702BXSX dot whatever the function name is. So it just bulk redirects it so that it doesn't even have to deal with those. Question? No? Okay. Yes? And if you were looking at the, uh, the export address table, would you see that forwarding? Export in this one? Yes, yeah. absolutely. So you'd see this one. It's like, oh, that's an interesting DLL. It seems to like export almost everything over to some other DLL, right? That would be pretty suspicious in and of itself. But, uh, you know, I think actually someone else brought up that point in the other class of, you know, well, could we just do some heuristic detection over all of our DLLs and see, you know, are there any that are like exporting like greater than 50% of their things? Because in, in reality, you almost never see this exports. And when you do see it, it's onesies, twosies kind of thing. But so, how many DLLs are honestly? Lots. Right? But if you're already running like a file integrity scanner, right? If you're already, when something is accessed, you're going to like just in time take a look at it, right? Semantic already. Antivirus scanners are already only looking at a file when it happens to be accessed. So it's theoretically possible, but uh, as uh, There's no reason that it needs to use this export forwarding mechanism, right? This thing could just go ahead and import all of the functions from here, and it could just call them directly, right? It doesn't need to, like, so it could export every single thing, and they would all go to here, 
And then each of these things would just call to here, right? What it's doing right now is it's exporting 13 of these things, and for the rest, it's redirecting here so that when the OS loader runs, for all of the imports over here that are asking for the stuff they don't care about, it gets directly filled in with something that's not going to be met in the middle. It doesn't have to even, it'll never even hear about it. For only those things that it cares about, it makes sure that the imports of this program get filled in with an address on their version of the thing. So uh, if you'd like to know more about function redirection, I recommend this link on this accidentally. And basically, it's sort of like an exact tutorial of what someone would have to do to write like a Stuxnet-esque Trojan. Right? You basically, first you dump out all the exports of the, tro of the DLL that you want to uh, hook. And then you like dump those into a .def file. And then you forward those to that. And so if you look at that, that'll, that'll kind of tell you more about how you can uh, how you can make your own Trojaning DLL. All right, so now, yep. just to go back to something that we skipped over before, back in the bound import days when we were talking about that, we said actually, the bound imports, so the, the entry in the uh, data directory for the bound imports points at a bunch of these descriptors, right? So a bunch of these descriptors, one for each module name, saying like, okay, for module name, kernel32.dll, you need to check whether it's bound against, whether the time date stamp of the one that you're going to load up, whether the time date stamp in the exports of the one you're going to load up matches this time date stamp. And there was this number of module forwarder refs that we ignored before. But in reality, this has to do with whether or not this module is forwarding on to some other module. If it is, then this thing will be non-zero. And then immediately following it will be this structure, which is basically, again, just saying the minimal information that the OS needs to check in order to sanity check the, uh, the bound imports. So going back to when we're talking about bound imports, and we just kind of skipped over this. Right, so remember bound imports, you got your data directory entry. It points at a bunch of these structures, which look something like this. Right, each of them is just saying, okay, if you want to, you need to check whether shell32.dll is still the same version that I bound against and assume stuff for. Now actually, right about here, kernel32.dll. Okay, time date stamp, but it's got a non-zero number of forwarder things because we just looked at the exports for kernel32.dll, and we said it forwards one of those exports to ntdll.rtl add vectored exception handler, whatever. So when you, have, when you have a module like kernel32, which makes use of um, forwarding exports, then back in the binding of things, you need to still tell the OS loader, well, I don't know whether notepad.exe imported vectored exception handler or not. Uh, and therefore, you need to go check whether or not you know, any NTDLL which is being imported into this is uh, still the correct version. Because it could have asked for add vectored exception handler from kernel32.dll, but it would have gotten RTL add vectored exception handler from NTDLL. So you need to go check that one as well. So this is just a little array of this, which follows immediately after anyone who has a non-zero thing. For all the rest of these, these have zeros. So these are that first type of structure, first type of structure. And then if this is non-zero, you get that second type structure, which just has, which just itself cannot like forward on to more things. It's just, uh, if this is like five, there would be five of them here, each of which has zero for the reserve field. So this is back in the bound imports, just making reference to the fact that if something uses forwarded exports, the OS loader better go check the thing that it forwarded to as well. All righty. Okay. Pop quiz, hot shots. What are the three types of imports? Rob.
Who else has another one? We got bound imports. Delayed, Delayed imports. Mm -hmm. Nope, that's, well, that's a subclass of mm -hmm. regular imports, and that's me spoiling it. Regular imports, was the, I'm just calling it normal imports. Normal imports can be by name or by ordinal, right? Uh, but what's the difference between doing it by name or ordinal? If you're importing by name or ordinal, what's the difference in terms of, like, how you go about searching the export information? So we have those three arrays, right? And that exports picture we have three arrays. And so if we're doing by name versus ordinal, which arrays are we checking in name? Which arrays are we checking in ordinal? Remember? Okay. Anyone else? Difference between name versus ordinal? You, you, check, the list of, you check the list of names uh, that are in alphabetical order. Yep. Uh, in one instance, right? Yep, that's correct. And in the other? And you, then you could use a binary search. And in, in the other, uh, I think you have to search by, uh, you have to kind of search by offsets, memory offsets. Right. So that ordinal was basically an uh, index uh, into that, um, into just the table. Of yeah, the names are an index into that. Right. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I've been, uh, I just got my kind of connectivity back after about uh, 15 minutes. I've been going through your slides. <laughs> okay, the difference was basically right. The difference was basically when you're importing by name, you have to start at the names table and you got to search for the string during a binary search. If you're importing by ordinal, then you would start here and you try to find the specific ordinal that you're asking for. I mean, ostensibly, you know, you're thinking that you'd like to just be able to go directly to that, but I don't think that actually works. I think you have to search for the ordinal in this table, check this string, and sanity check answer. I mean, theoretically, maybe, maybe there is some version information that I don't know about. I'd have to go double check on that. Theoretically, you could just jump straight to the ordinal here, but I believe you look for the ordinal here, you go down to this table, check if the string matches, because we had the ordinal was in the hint, and then we had the string for the name immediately after. Check if the string matches. If so, then go ahead and go to that uh, ordinal in the thing. Otherwise, it could be basically saying your, your uh, importing by ordinal could be out of date, potentially. Well, I don't know if, if you just import by ordinal out of date, if it just does it anyways. Uh, let's see, Corey, binding versus ALSR. There can be only one. True or false? True. Why? Uh, there can be only one when you're using it. Hold on, Chris. I'm asking Corey. Do you either bind directly? Yes, because if you use ALSR, well, you will know where the DLLs want to be based, right? It's just that most of the time they won't be based where they want to be based, right? So at bind time, the linker just assumes whatever is in the image base field of the optional header, that's where it's going to be based. But in reality, when you're using ALSR, they'll be put wherever, willy-nilly. And, uh, and then therefore, most of the time they're going to be wrong anyways, and therefore the uh, the OS loader is going to have to fall back to doing whatever it normally would have done. Yes. Well, what about backward compatibility? Right. So you so so you can still do binding, right? So the functionality still works, and it'll still work on non ALSR systems and things like that. It's just that for going forward, binding is being deprecated because ALSR is going to make it such that most of the time you're not going to get any benefit. Yes. I'm going to regain my ignorance here. You keep saying most of the time, and my impression was that you know, the address space is large enough, especially in like a 64-bit system, that binding would the, the the binding would be wrong like almost all of the time except for the flu. Sure, on 64-bit system that's probably true. On 32-bit systems, it's my impression that uh, they only have like something like 256 possible randomizations essentially. Okay. So when I say most of the time, I'm thinking like probability of 1 over 2 to 56. Okay. And realize 
I think so. Yeah, so on 32-bit systems, it's always very much smaller randomization. You only have so much memory space in which to work. 64-bit systems, yeah, you got a ton of space. It's it's near near zero probability of being ever working out for you. All right. Um, John, what did the life size cutout of Anakin Skywalker look like? With what sort of toppings? Mustard and relish. Close, mustard and relish. Good job. Last time, uh, last time the person definitely got that very accurate. I didn't think there was anything beyond mustard. Let's double check again. All right, maybe that's onions, but I'm going to say it's relish. <laughs> Now, theoretically, this is where I would have a lab on export address table hooking. But I haven't found something that I can do that's really has the punch of that import address table hooking. So I still need, I'm still thinking about this. This is why it's still a beta class. Um, but uh, Bill, can we go over to the board? I want to talk a little bit about how export address table hooking potentially makes the import address table hooking attack that much better. And so we knew that in our import address table hack, whereas normal, tel whereas normal, uh, say, was, right? So in our, in our import address table hooking lab, we had a task manager, and we said task manager normally uses this blue path, and it calls directly to NT query system information in NT DLL, right? In our attack, we loaded up our attacker DLL, which was app init iat.dll. And we said the attacker goes in, finds task manager amongst all these loaded modules, finds task manager, finds its import address table, and fills it in with a pointer to its hooked version of NT query system. And that hooked version just immediately calls NT DLL. That returns to here. Attacker filters out calc.exe from the results and returns back to task manager wherever it called it. Now, the thing is, this subverts only task manager's view, right? So for anyone else in this module space, which happens to import uh, NT query system information, they could potentially see the real values. And, you know, if they compared their result against what task manager got, let's say there was, you know, some security process or something which was trying to do a cross view, which is basically where you say, well, I'm going to check it from task manager's view. I'm going to check it from, you know, security app.dll's view, and then we're going to see if the two ever differ. Because if the two differ, someone's trying to hide something, right? Well, the thing there is, let's say there was, you know, such a security app. Actually, there, I think there is a real security.dll, but whatever. We'll call this third-party security, Xeno security. DLL. Let's say I inject my Xeno security DLL into like everyone's process address space and I'm like trying to like check import address tables to see if they're messed up and things like that. Now, when the attacker initially came, he just looked in the loaded module list for this module. What he could have done is he could have went to every single module and he could have like hacked all of their import address tables, right? There's not, nothing that would have stopped him from like modifying everyone's import address tables. So my security application would have, you know, seen just as subverted a view. Now, that works well, except what if there's a DLL that's loaded? So this works good when the attacker comes in and everyone's DLL is already loaded. What if some new DLL gets loaded, like, at some random point in the future? Two things can happen. A, attacker does nothing, in which case this new, like, Xeno security DLL 2 that DLL gets moved in at some point in the future, and it now has an unhooked import address table because this code only hooked whatever was there when it first started up. So this one could come in, and it would be unhooked, and now it could see that something had changed. Or B, if the attacker has some way to find out when new modules are inserted into this address space, if they can get called back and, like, so that every time, well, either if they get called back or if they're just continuously checking this list, right, they could just continuously keep walking that list and say, is there anything new? Is there anything new? Keep a little data structure off to the side saying, here's all the things I've hacked. If there's something new that's unhacked, hack it. So there's a couple options. Either A, the new thing that gets added in here will work 
uh, as intended and it'll call the real version or B, the attacker will just eventually subvert it as well. If the attacker doesn't want to have to worry about the fact that, you know, someone new gets added in later, we'll say that, you know, Xeno security 2 gets added in later. If the attacker wants to make it so that when Xeno security 2 is loaded, whenever it's loaded, that it gets hacked and it always points at the attacker in its import address table for NT query system information, what he can do is go to NTDLL and modify its export address table. So if he modifies the export address table, we said those export address tables are, you know, just a big list of function pointers. <coughs> right? So if the attacker goes to ntdll.dll's export address table and he fills in the NT query system information entry with an offset, which is so big, back to the board. Bill? Yeah. So if he goes into the export address table of NTDLL and he fills in an offset which is so big that the offset is, you know, so if someone does this base address plus, you know, some huge value such that it, this plus offset equals somewhere in the attacker's code, then when this thing gets loaded in, the OS is going to load Xeno Security 2 at some later point. The OS is going to say, oh, I see that you're looking for NT query system information in NTDLL. I'll just go and look at the export address table of this. Let's see if I can get this some useful way. Export address table. And we're saying that the export address table is, heck, you know, whereas the original version would have, you know, see, what am I doing here? Blue is original, green is hacked. Maybe the original uh, export address table would have pointed to the actual implementation of uh, NT query system information. But the hacked export address table has an RVA which is big enough that it actually points into the attacker. So basically, by hacking the export address table, the attacker is making the OS do the hard work for him so that for every new module which gets loaded in, when the OS goes and tries to resolve this guy's import address table, it consults this guy's export address table, which points it here, and therefore this plus this is the absolute address of that, and the OS loader takes that absolute address and sticks it into this guy's import address table. So it becomes automatically hacked so that if it would have called anti-query DLL or anti-query system information, it will automatically get redirected to the attacker. So uh, hacking the export address table basically just makes it so that the attacker can have some confidence that he need do nothing else. He gets loaded, he hacks every module that's currently there, and then he hacks the export address table of the things that he's changing anyways, so that if the OS happens to load something new at some point in the future, it'll just automatically be pointing at the attacker's code instead. So don't have a punchy demo for that. I mean, in order for me to do a demo for this, like with our current import address table hack, I would have to like load some DLL which like drops out like the process list to like a file and then I would show that that gets hacked and then I would have to load a new one later and show that that one's okay unless I hack the export address table. So it'd be a little circuitous and uh, I got to think of a good way to show that first. So in the meantime, you can go read that. So this first talks about import address table hooking and then it talks about why you want to uh, do export address table hooking. And Corey, if you believe it, this is written by Anton Bassoff. Say nothing. I don't want anything recorded here on the audio. I'm just saying is all. All right. So now we're going to move on to learning about some debug information. We've got the bulk of everything out of the way now. Like, okay. 130 slides to get through the initial like DOS headers, file header, optional header, section header, and then huge discussion of imports and huge discussion of exports. Well, not, not necessarily as huge as one might like discussion of exports. So now we're on to just the miscellaneous little things that I think 
are of interest to you in the uh, in the rest of PE. So, data directory entry for debug information points at a structure that has debug information. So, do I have written out stuff for this? Yes, good. So the main thing, so under the type field, these are the possible types that are in NT, WinNT.h. But we're only going to care about this one, the code view type, because this is the most common thing we're going to see. This is what Microsoft is using for all of their debug symbols nowadays. You know, back in the day, it would have been cough or some other things. Fix up. I think that's for if you omit function pointers, frame pointers. So time date stamp. Yet again, this one is a real time date stamp, and it. I believe this is only set if something changes about your debug information. So. If nothing changed about your debug information, this can keep staying the same. And it can differ from your file header .time date stamp, which will change every time you recompile. But this one need not necessarily if your debug information doesn't change. Type was that thing that I just talked about. And the size of data is that if you have a specific type, um, this address of raw data is going to be pointing at some debug structure. The type of debug structure, so it's basically that depending on what type of, depending on what type you have specified, this address of raw data is going to point at some other structure. That structure is going to have size of data size. So it's just going to be as big as size of data says it is. And the pointer to raw data is actually, again, a file pointer into the, uh, into the actual file. So it's saying, like, you pointer to raw data amount of bytes into this file is where this debug information is set. So that if you want to like go find the debug information while it's still on disk, right, you're not always accessing it just when this thing's mapped into memory. If you want to go to some file, find its debug information, you'd go to the debug section, look at this stuff, go to pointer of raw data, and then go to size of data, and you'd read that much chunk of stuff. You'd interpret it according to whatever the type field is set to. And the address of raw data is just if this thing is actually uh, loaded into memory, then that's the RVA, which points at it in memory. So this points at it in memory. This points at it on disk. And in this case, there's only one size. They're both the same size. It's always size of data big. So I'm not going to go into this a lot, because this is just a miscellaneous definition but if your size is, or if your type is set to that code view type, then there's go, then essentially the debug information is going to be interpreted according to these structures. We're not going to care about these structures much. There's uh, two different version information. So I'll just show a quick interpretation. But ultimately, what I'm really trying to get you to is this thing right here, this, this uh, string at the end of a code view thing. It's uh, the string which points to the file name of uh, the actual debug symbol file. So according to those previous structures, there was like a header, and the header had a signature. And the signa there's also an offset, signature, age, and then eventually this PDB file name. So if you want on your own time, you can go back and you know look and understand this thing. But really, all we care about is that after age is the PDB file name field. And so this is going to be a null terminated string which points you at the file name of the debug stuff. So this was for acledit.dll, and the debug symbol information file is acledit.pdb. So I think it's portable debug file, something like that. <coughs> so .pdb are the debug symbol files which are created for, uh, which is created for anything you compile on uh, Windows these days with Visual Studio or their DDK, their driver development environment. And yes, overall, it's all just this structure, CV info PDB 220. All right. So the relevance here is, again, back to that uh, Hogland talk from the summer, where he was talking about pulling in miscellaneous traits from, uh, from executables in order for doing some attribution of the malware authors. What he was pointing out is that uh, people have been careless thus far, and they uh, basically don't change those PDB paths within the debug information. 
And so in some cases, we get these like full paths to actually where they compiled the file. So Ghost, this was from that GhostNet stuff where they said the Chinese were hacking the Tibetan dissidents or whatever activists. Uh, Aurora, that was the Google attack, right? Where it got the Aurora name from was this string because whoever was making their attack code happened to call it Aurora as well. Uh, and then this is from Stuxnet. This was that Mertus, whatever, guava thing. And so these were actually the strings that were embedded in the debug information section of the executables for the malware that were found. And so, for instance, you know, Hoagland was saying, like, well, he assumed that this, due to the SSDT, this was, like, something modifying a system service descriptor table, which is a kernel structure. But then he would, like, actually search through a large database of... Uh, of malware, just searching for the string re ssdt, or you can like you know search across your all the files on your system, right? If you catch something on one computer that has this malware, you know maybe the malware itself is polymorphic, but the problem is again the authors have been being careless, and you know maybe this is a thing of the past, and maybe they'll get a clue now that he's given that talk. But uh, the point is, if you catch something, and if they have these sort of tool marks in it you can potentially then just really just go search everywhere for this sort of thing. You know, if you see that someone is compiling code here, you don't care necessarily which piece it is, right? There may be many different files spread throughout your compromised systems throughout your enterprise. You'll search for that string in every file everywhere if you have that capability, right? So you need that capability to go out and uh, touch all of those hosts, but you can potentially take some unique things like this, which are leftovers, and uh, go search for stuff. So that was all we're going to say about debug information, basically. You just, uh, within, within PE view, you can go find this thing, but this isn't going to help you. You're going to need this uh, RVA right there. I'll just, I'll pick a random thing like Notepad or something. Right, so if you want to find the things, Either A, if you're parsing the file yourself, you go to the data directory, you find the RVA 1350, but, you know, PEView has already done this for us. So, at, wait, that's not it, that's it. At 1350, there's this data structure, right? This is always going to be, you know, this is the standard data structure for the debug information, but then it's saying, what I really am doing is I'm pointing at type 2, which is code view. And it's got a size of 24, and the RVA of it is 18F0. And so P view went in and it said, okay, at 18F0, 24 bytes, this is the stuff. So this is an instance where P view doesn't actually know how to interpret this code view thing. Otherwise, it would like to break it apart. And that's why I put the structure definitions for if you care, because uh, you can break it apart manually yourself then and always find the string portion of it. Any questions on debug stuff before we go on? I mean, really, the point is just here's how you go find the string that holds the debug uh, file name. And it was useful for some of these high profile malware things. They had full paths in their, in their debug information. Any questions? All right, continuing on. All right, now we're going to talk about relocations. So I made reference to these multiple times. Again, start at the data directory. And what this is going to do is this is going to point at, um, well, okay, first of all, relocations typically get their own section called dot .reloc. Uh, and this isn't on the, on the big picture here. So we're just going to have to go look at this in P view. But basically there's a, uh, data structure, well, there's an array of image-based relocation structures, and this is the definition right here. So an image-based relocation structure starts with a virtual address and then has a size, size of block, and there's going to be some arrays of those. The thing is, actually, immediately after the structure is going to be a bunch of relocation information. So virtual address is saying, so what, real, okay, let me back up a second. The whole point of relocations, did I put that on there? No, I didn't. I love an overview of relocations. All 
All right. So the point of relocations is for those times when the OS loader is not able to load a DLL or an executable at its preferred image base, so the image base field in the optional header, if it can't get that location, if it's not free, or if it's just doing ALSR and it's moving it around, if it can't get that location, the problem is there's code throughout the executable which assumes that, so there's actually like assembly code which assumes that I will get loaded at my preferred base address. And therefore, if I access some data within myself, it's going to be at that base address plus something, but they actually put the literal value, you know, the literal value which is that base address plus something under the, they're assuming that they get their own base address. And so like if I'm accessing something in the, well, let's say um, over to the board. Uh, Bill, over to the board. If I'm accessing, let's say that task manager has some assembly code in it and it, it assumes that it's going to get base address 10000. There may be some assembly code in there that says, okay, well, I know that within this range, you know, maybe this chunk here is dot text. Maybe this chunk here is dot data, right? And so some code in the dot text section could be trying to access data in the dot data section. And it's going to say, oh, well, I know that my data is at, you know, 1000123 or something like that. So it'll have the hard coded address in the assembly instruction accessing 1000123. Actually, a good example of that is those strings we saw before, right? We said whenever we have like a printf and we're pushing the pointer to the string on the, on the, the stack, said that pointer to the string is actually down here in like dot R data, right? R data, right? So all of those strings where it's saying like here, here's the string of my hello world thing, right? It's really just hard coding that value somewhere within itself assuming that it gets its base address. If it's not loaded at its base address, that pointer is not going to be correct. So the point of the relocations is there's this big list of everywhere that the code assumes that there's going to be an address which starts at this base address. And if this gets moved in memory, so if this gets, you know, put down here, to, or put up here to 200000, all of those hard-coded addresses like 10000, need to get fixed up to be two zero 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 zero, right? And the whole point of the relocations is it's just the exhaustive list of every single place in my binary where I got to fix it up if I move it. So that's the whole point of the relocations. And so what this virtual address is actually saying is each virtual address field is, uh, is actually just taking a chunk, it's taking one page at a time from this binary and it's saying, the following data applies only to starting at address zero, going at maximum to address, you know, F, 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 three Fs, right? So there'll be one of these data structures that says all of my relocations are in the range, you know, starting at RVA zero. So it's, it, these are actually RVAs within this thing. It's saying starting at RVA zero going to F, 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 F. The next one, the next data structure like this will say all of these fix-ups occur from 1000 to 1FFF. All of these fix-ups occur from 2000 to FFF, right? So each of these, yeah, tiny, tiny. I'm sure you can't see that on, on the remote thing, but maybe I'll draw it bigger as well. Let's say we have task manager right here. And let's say task manager thinks it's going to get loaded at 100 and whatever, six zeros, something like that. It assumes it's going to get loaded here, but I said that, you know, it also will have accesses to, you know, let's say the, let's say this is dot text, this is dot data, this is dot R data. Right, so it's going to have some hard-coded addresses like into here at one zero zero, you know, one two three zero or something like that. There will be hard-coded things within the dot text section where code assumes that there's going to be something at this location. But if it gets moved, that is going to be wrong. So each of these relocation structures is going to take a hex one thousand size maximally chunk of this and say, 
within this range from 0 to F, 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 you know, I have some relocations which apply to that. And then the next one comes along and it says within the range X1000 to 1 F, 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 there's going to be some relocations in there. And then again, similarly, 2000 to 2 F, F, F. So each of those data structures is just saying, I got some relocations for you to apply. They only apply to this range within this binary. And the size of block, essentially, so how this, okay, sorry, back to the board again. How, this, how these data structures are actually going to work is how uh, the relocation structure actually works, image-based relocation. I'm sorry. The way the structure actually looks is you have size of block virtual address and then there's a bunch of data immediately after this which this is the stuff which is saying like fix up this location so it actually the first byte is like a type and then these three bytes are an offset offset and we'll see that in a second. But the only reason I wanted to say that this is the way this is overall structured, so this is a ditto, these are all the same thing, is that the size of block is this total size. So there could be one of these, there could be ten of these, but the size of block tells you how many of these there are. Because it's saying, take these two fields plus however many things I have immediately after them. So, this is an example of what this actually looks like. This right here, this RVA, oops, RVA of block, within P view, this RVA of block is the virtual address field. The size of block, this 3C is saying, you know, there's eight bytes for just my RVA of block and the size of block, but then there's however many bytes for the things immediately after it. So, let me see here. Yep. So basically, that's what, what this, what this uh, third bullet is saying, is immediately following the size of block field are some number of word size relocation targets. So they're word size because of the range which they can actually cover. And so each of these, uh, over to the board bill. So I misspoke when I said this was, you know, that's a byte and the rest is that. Actually, no, this is correct. So this right here, that's 4 bits and this is 12 bits. Because this overall thing is a word, it's 16 bits. This first 4 bits is going to say, this is the type. And this next 12 bits is going to say this is the offset into this virtual address. So if the virtual address is 0, and if I can specify at most 12 bits here, that's why it only goes from the range, you know, 0 to FFF because of this can, well, 12 bits can go from 0 to FFF, right? Each, each hex nibble is 4 bits. So basically, let's say that, let's say that this type and offset right here, let's say the type was 3, which we'll see in a second, they're pretty much all three. Let's say the offset is you know, 0, 0, 004 or something like that. Let's say this one is three, and this one's offset is 0, 1, 2, something like that. What this overall structure is just trying to say is, if this virtual address is zero, and this block size is whatever it is, I don't care how big it is, then what it's saying is, at the RVA, zero plus four, into this task manager, there is something you must fix up. Now, of course, that's too small because that's all headers, but let's, let's assume that this is our 1000 kind of thing. So let's say there is nothing, no relocations for this one. There's only a structure that says, starting at RVA hex 1000, I need to add 4 to that. And so 
1004, dear linker, or sorry, dear OS loader, if you move task manager away from, you know, 10000, if you move this, you know, how much do I want to destroy? All of this up to 20000. If the, if the OS loader moves this thing from 1000 to 2000, that's a difference of, you know, 10000. And so it's saying, you need to go to this RVA in your code and then add whatever difference you just moved this thing by. So the delta here, you know, the delta is x1000. I should maybe move that to uh, something else that we're not confused by. the values. If the OS loader decides to load this thing at 201000 instead of 10000 where it was going to get loaded, where the image base said it wanted to get loaded, then it needs to calculate the delta, which is you no know, 101000. That's the total difference. It needs to go to RVA1004, so it needs to take that base address, go 1004 into it to address 202004, right? You see how I did that? I took the RVA1004, added it to the base address, got 202004. Go to that address, and for those four bytes, add the delta. So however much you changed it by, you need to fix it up because, I mean, it makes sense because if this, if this thing thought there was some code at 10, you know, if this code right here thought there was some data at 1000123, if it's still trying to access 1003, it's like accessing outside of its memory space. But if we take, you know, this original reference to 1001230 and we add in the delta, right, the delta is, this is 100, one two three zero plus one zero one zero zero zero. Does it seem right? I think I'm just trying it wrong. So I mean, the delta between where it was loaded versus where it wanted to be loaded—that's that, right? And so. What am I doing wrong here? Something wrong. I think there should be another zero on this. Two, four, six. Two, four, six. Yes. That's my problem. One, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. All right, so I get now two, zero, one. So this ultimate reference, what was a 1001230, should really be, now that it got moved to that base address, 2011230, because that's where it got moved to in memory. So the whole point of relocations is just a big list of here's all the locations you should fix. And this list is organized such that each blob of this only covers hex 1000 bytes at a time. So it says, starting at hex 1000, Here's, you know, my three extra bits that can be added to this. So this can go from, you know, if this was a zero, this could go from the range 1, 0, 0, 2, 1, F, F, F. If you want to specify that RVA, you know, 2, 0, 0, 0 has a thing, you need a new blob of this that has virtual address equal to 2000, hex 2000, and then, you know, for this thing, it'll have some offset below it. It'll have each of these things where it specifies some offset plus 2000. Go there, fix up per the delta. So let's look at this quick in P view again. Actually, I'm going to look at this in CFF Explorer so that we can hopefully see, you know, this didn't work for me last time, but hopefully we'll see some actual assembly code which is accessing uh, 
a hard-coded address that could become incorrect. So, open up PView. And let's just open up Notepad. Um, not Notepad. Let's open up acledit.dll. acledit.dll, which is, as usual, in C colon Windows System 32. And then acledit.dll. Open that up. And now if we expand the dot reloc section, and we kick, click on the image base relocations, what we'll see is that it starts with a block that has a virtual address of hex 1000. And then it's saying that the size of the block is, you know, 44C bytes. That's just saying I have a really lot of those things immediately after it. And so what it's saying is, for each of these, so the problem here, okay, this is another case where it can get a little confusing if you're not clear on what P view is actually doing. As usual, this data column is the literal data at this location. The three at the beginning, this is like I said over there, the first four bits is just a type. And that type just happens to be this image rel, base, high, low. We don't care what that really means right now because it's pretty much always that. So the first three bits is, uh, first four bits is just a type. So each of these is specifying some offset from that virtual address specified in the first field. And so, for instance, if that's hex 1000 and this is 6D4, then the total RVA where you need to go fix something is 16D4, right? So this is just interpolating each of those for you and saying, you're currently in a block that starts at 1000. You're currently giving me an offset that is 6D4. That's going to be 164. So if we, you know, scroll down to the next block where it has some offset other than hex 1000, So you can see it, it specified offsets all the way up to FFC, right? And in reality, I was putting FFF over there, but in reality, you probably don't want to have something which crosses boundaries. But I think it may be actually possible. But yeah, I think it is possible, actually. But anyways, the last one was like FFC, and so one FFC. Now we go on to the next block, and the next block says 2,000 plus, you gave me an offset of 0, so 2,000. 2,000 plus, offset of C, 2,000 C, etc. So this is, you know, the exhaustive list of every single place within this function where, or within this module where if you change the base address, the OS loader actually needs to go in here and fix all these things up. So this is one of those uh, hidden costs of ALSR is that back when the DLLs got to actually load wherever they, you know, wherever they wanted as long as that space was still free, you never had to deal with this relocation. When you're always moving things around, you need to go through every single location here and add in the delta of where you loaded it versus where it assumed it would have been loaded. So now, yeah, just before lunch, I'm going to try this little uh, experiment. I'm going to just pick some RVA, let's say, pretty far into this. Well, first I'm going to see what the .txt section range. The problem here is all of those initial things so here's my .txt section. The initial parts, so it was telling me, like, I need to fix something up at RVA 1000, 1004, 1008, stuff like that. The thing is, all that 1000, 1004, 1008, things like that, those are all, like, my import address table. So I actually want to try to find, like, some code fix up so that I can go disassemble it and show you an instruction, which is using a hard-coded thing. So what I think I need to find is some fix up that is at an RVA greater than uh, 13968. So I'm going to go to the relocations, find something greater than 13568, unless I'm interpreting this wrong. Where's the actual? Okay, I'm interpreting that wrong then. Ah, okay. That's going to be 
Well, I don't know if this is going to work still. Like I said, this isn't one I prepared, but I still just keep trying it anyways. So I'm going to try one at the, um, at the E offset. So let's pick something right about here. So this block is saying that, OK, if this thing is moved in memory, at the offset E0000 plus 2E, so E0 to E, at offset E0 to E into this thing's virtual memory, there's going to be some code or something which is trying to access a value which is based on the original hard-coded address. So first I'm going to see if I can actually, well, no, I'm going to just try it. Open up from CFF Explorer. So I said that the thing I like about CFF Explorer is that it gives me the ability to disassemble code. So I'm going to use it to open up Notepad like I had just done with P view. Was it not open? Oh, it was ACL edit, wasn't it? Thank you. Do ACL edit DLL. So I'm going to open this up and I'm going to see if I can disassemble the code um, at the offset which an RVA or which a um, which a relocation thing says is going to be fixed up. The thing is I can't disassemble exactly at the offset because that's not going to be the beginning of the structure, uh, beginning of the instruction. Uh, because we would have something like, uh, over to the board please. If I had something like you know, push 1001230, something like that, the actual byte stream, you know, the push may be Whatever it is, I don't know off the top of my head. Let's say it's x53. Let's say we knew how to draw. You know, x53, and then this is in little endian order, so it's x30, x12, x01, x10. The thing is, those um, the relocations are giving you the address of this right here. Because it has to point at the address of the actual literal data value which needs to be fixed up, right? So all of those RVAs in there, they're saying go to this address and like add in the delta. So I can't just start disassembling at that address. I need to like try some number of bytes back from that to see if I can actually catch a catch an instruction. So I'm going to try the two or the E023, and I'm going to try that minus one to start with. E023. Call it two two. I don't think so. Two three or two e. Ah, uh, you're right. It was two e, and so subtract one for two d. Well, theoretically that's true. So theoretically, I'm gonna pretend like that is uh, the actual instruction. I have no way to guarantee that this is the actual instruction, but Let's say that somewhere within, yeah, I, I can guarantee this is not the instruction because there's just a data byte after it, but let's pretend that data byte's not there. And somewhere within the executable, there is an instruction add constant to EAX. And let's pretend that constant is like even vaguely within the correct module address space. Therefore, the relocations are saying you got to go and fix that constant because if we move this thing in memory, that constant's not right anymore. And so the whole point of the relocations is just a big exhaustive list saying, here's all the constants you got to fix. So I'm going to subtract one again and see if that, about that. That kind of looks right now. Except then that can't be right because then these four bytes would be, need to be the actual bytes which are being relocated. So. Anyways, eventually I'll get a real example here that actually makes sense. Be all good. All right, any questions? Okay, no, I'm not done with relocations yet. Let's see. So this was just reiterating the fact that for all of those data values, those words that are immediately after the relocation, uh, virtual address and size of block, uh, take the first four bits and just treat it as one of these types. And here I'm saying it's almost always three. It's this high-low. And really all that high-low is saying is that you should take the total virtual address and add those four bits, uh, sorry, 12 bits from the rest of the thing. I already kind of went over that. 
All right. So here's the one thing I wanted to say about memory integrity checking with respect to relocations. So if uh, oh, uh, Bill over to the board. So before I was talking about the various things that you know if we're injecting security DLLs into things and we want to do maybe we want to like go down and check the import address table of everyone to make sure that you know if this thing says it's got imports from NTDLL we want to check that they actually point into NTDLL or not an attacker code or just any other code. Another thing you could potentially do is you could go in and like check that the uh, check that the code in memory matches the code on disk to make sure no one has like written new instructions into those because that's that other version the app init hook that I based the import address table hooking on I said that that goes in there and it'll like change the code in NTDLL to redirect it to the attacker rather than changing the import address table here. So one thing you might want to do in order to like check that nothing's been screwed with here in memory is check code and stuff like that. The relocations are directly relevant to that because if you're trying to like check this code in memory versus the code on disk, the issue is if this code moved in memory, then we know that all of those relocation locations in memory got fixed up, right? So we know that there used to be, in the original version, there was some access to this constant. And that's like literally built into an instruction. And in this code, the OS loader went in and it changed that hard-coded constant in the instruction stream. So if you tried to take task manager and go out and like check that chunk of code versus what's on disk, right? It says on disk that it's non-writable. So it shouldn't be different, right? Uh, but the OS loader went in and it like changed everything up if it had to move something. So anyone wanting to fix up or anyone wanting to compare what's in memory versus what's on disk under the assumption that what's on disk is, you know, the clean version needs to understand how relocations work and has to compensate for them so that when they have their clean version, they apply the exact same relocations the same way the OS would have so that the two things look the same and then you can hash them or do whatever you want to do. So that's all I wanted to say about relocations and memory integrity checking. Any questions about relocations? Um, you know, why they're necessary when, uh, well, let me say this one last thing then. So Mark had mentioned position independent code before, right? There is the ability to write code which doesn't have assumptions about, you know, if instead of doing something like having a hard coded, having a hard coded uh, push 101230, right? Instead of doing that, I could have something which reads, you know, it finds the address of the R data, right? It finds the start of the address of the R data, and then it adds whatever that address is to some offset 1230. And so I could calculate that all and put it in a register, and then I could push whatever's in the register, something like that. So I could do things which are position independent, in that they don't have hard-coded constants like this, but it requires that many extra instructions, right? Find the R data section, add in the offset, put it into a register, push that register instead. So position independent code is generally, requires much, uh, more assembly instructions, it's going to take longer to run, right? The more times you're doing this, you know, that, that four extra instructions multiplied by if you have code that's looping and doing millions of times, that's going to be a, a difference in time. Uh, so the point is, that's why Windows basically just writes code which assumes stuff. And, you know, going with their, the, um, going with the theme that you've seen thus far, they say, well, if we got to, we'll fix everything up right at the beginning, and then we'll let the thing run. So that's what they did for imports. They said, let's just load up all the imports right at the beginning and get them all ready and then run. If we need to fix up the code, so be it. We'll fix it up all at the beginning, and then we'll let it run. And so you could make position independent code, which takes more time to run, but which starts faster. Uh, but that's sort of the trade off that you have there. You can either write code which starts up faster, but takes longer to run or you can write code which takes longer to start up, but which runs faster. And so Windows went for throw all of the uh, performance impact at the beginning and then just let it run after that. So, all right, any questions? And, oh, sorry, and then you can't even, you don't even have the option within their development environment to like ask it to make position independent code. In GCC, you can say, okay, 
dear compiler, please give me position independent code, but by default it won't be position independent. And on Microsoft, you don't even have the option. So, any other questions about uh, what we've gone over since the last break, which was relocations, debug information, which I said I only want, to, want you to know that you can go find strings there. Um, export address table, we just talked about the uh, export forwarding and stuff, actually. So, many slides since the last break. <laughs>